Pharmacy Friends brings industry experts to the same table to talk about what's happening in pharmacy today, what's coming, and most importantly, what it means to you. In this special episode, we are on the road in New York City at our 21st annual Specialty Summit. And I'm your special host, Jordan Almazan, Director of Clinical Strategy and Innovation, standing in for Miriam Tabatavai. More than 600 people have come to Times Square to listen to exceptional speakers, gain insight from expert panels, and network with the brightest minds in specialty. Today, we're talking with a number of leaders at Prime and how each of them is focusing their work on the three pieces of our newly formed framework. We want to help make medications more affordable, deliver an easy, transparent experience, and most importantly, help people achieve better health. Now let's get into the next portion of the show. This is one of my favorite topics, the frontier of medicine, where sci-fi is becoming a reality. We're talking about cell and gene therapies. These treatments represent a seismic shift in the way that we treat conditions, rewriting the code to life itself. But this promise also brings a heavy price tag. Here to help us navigate this space is Vice President of Specialty Clinical Strategy, Jim Ribello, who has deep experience supporting strategy and implementation of cell and gene solutions at Prime Therapeutics. Jim, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. So let's start with all the buzz that's going on here at the Specialty Summit. The FDA has approved a number of cell and gene therapies used to treat cancer, spinal muscular atrophy, hemophilia, sickle cell disease, and, and beyond. And some of the stats that I've heard, by the end of this year, we're going to have up to 25 cell and gene therapies on the market, and some with price tags of $4.25 million and above. So what's your take on all of this, Jim? Yeah, it's it's funny, Jordan, because you, you put out those stats, and it it sounds amazing that there's that many drugs out there, but it's it's actually not that that new, right? We had our first CAR T drug approved 2017. I actually remember leaving this conference, and someone on the train said, "Hey, did you hear the first CAR T drug was was just approved?" But that that was seven years ago. Now, un- unfortunately, we still really haven't figured all of this out yet. I was coming across a YouTube video by uh, Healthcare Triage when I was doing some research for a panel I'm hosting tomorrow. And in the video, they're advocating that the time is now to solve this. They're pointing to the hep C crisis, which was currently happening at the time where costs are going like, hey, we have to figure out how we're gonna pay for these drugs. And even though we've had, like you said, like a couple dozen therapies that are out there now, we're really still just getting our hands around what this really means. And it's really just in its infancy. Yeah, absolutely. I, I am really getting an appreciation for the complexity in this space. And so let's talk a little bit about that, right? So there's these tidal wave of challenges that are impacting all stakeholders, payers, patients, healthcare systems, et cetera. So in your view, what are all of these challenges? You and I were, were going back and forth about this just, just the other day, right? We think about cell and gene therapies compared to, I'll say, traditional specialty, right? We used to distinguish traditional from specialty, and now we have to distinguish specialty from cell and gene therapy. So even with specialty medications, which are very expensive, it's not that you just show up and you get this super expensive drug just one time, right? That, that cost is spread out over the lifetime of, of the member while they're taking the therapy. It seems expensive, but when you think about cell and gene therapy where these drugs have those seven digit price tags you're talking about, that hits the payer all at once. And just, no one's really prepared for that. So even the, it's not just the payer, the different stakeholders that are, that are out there, right? So we think about the healthcare systems, the providers that have to purchase these drugs. No one wants to have a $3 million drug just sitting on the shelf, right? A $50,000 drug sitting on the shelf is scary. So before you go and get that drug, you have to make sure, am I gonna get paid for this, right? So the members have to work with their, their health plan, could be Medicaid, Medicare, commercial insurance, with the healthcare system, the providers, to get all of that connected. And even though it's such a small amount of patients that are currently available to treat with these therapies, right now, unfortunately, it's taking a long time to get some of these members treated just because we haven't figured out that perfect system. Once we've identified the right patient, right, for the right drug, we can kind of get to that part. Now we have to figure, okay, well, how do we make $3 million come out for, you know, a, a, a self-funded group that only has 50 employees and now they have to figure out how they're gonna pay for this. 
Yeah, absolutely. And there's a number of things that you touched on there. And I imagine there's a lot of ways that organizations are thinking about how we innovate in this space, right? It's almost like these new therapies are bringing an era of innovation in the managed care space. So let's talk a little bit about that. What are the ways that Prime is addressing these challenges? And what are some of the things that we've explored so far? Yeah, thanks, Jordan, for that question. I'll go back to the specialty uh, reference again. You know, it was a privilege working with this organization. We were in a good position when specialty really started taking off. And I feel like it's a similar situation now because we have a lot of experience, not just managing specialty in general, but specialty across both pharmacy and medical benefit. So these gene therapies, cell and gene therapies, are typically not your traditional pharmacy benefit drugs, right? They're, they're not going to get dispensed at, at a pharmacy. And the medical benefit is a whole different beast. We have a lot of experience working outside your traditional PBM model. Now, I say that, but this is still very different from even your traditional medical benefit drugs, right? So we're, we're still constantly doing research and learning, um, not just with the clinical management, right? That, that used to be what everything was about, right? Just thinking about the clinical piece. But now the financial piece is different too, right? It's not just how do I incur, like I was saying in the, the last question, right? You have to figure out how do I get all the different stakeholders in the payer vertical to be able to say, hey, we can pay for this drug, right? Whether it's government, commercial, whatever it is, right? So. We're hoping, you know, our experience in these different areas, our relationships with these other companies that can help with some of the financial financial problems of the equation are going to put us in a great position to, I'm not saying we're going to cure this overnight, right? Like some of these gene therapies might be able to, but hopefully a few years from now, we're looking back and saying, okay, we have figured out. It might have took us eight years, right? But now we've come up with a good solution. Yeah, absolutely. And that's some of the stuff that's interested me most on the market, right? We've got new risk pools that are being developed. We've got uh, even Medicare has come out with these new models to think about how we're going to pay for these uh, cell and gene therapies in order to provide access. So uh, that, that's great. And I really appreciate you touching on that. Now, Jim, I know this is a very exciting a conference that we have and a very busy road ahead for us in the cell and gene therapy space. So I'd like to ask you, and I know you're a family guy, Jim. Um, in fact, I have the privilege and honor of working with your, your wife, Catherine, as well. Um, what are you looking forward to here in, in the city? Yeah, you know, I, I always love coming to New York. You know, I'm here at least once a year for this conference, but sometimes I have to come. Um, you know, we have some clients in the area as, as well. You know, the city never sleeps, as, as everyone says. There's um, something I'm looking forward to with my family later this year. Both my daughters are dancers, and they've always wanted to see the Rockettes. So I think this year we're going to do that christmas theme trip where we get to come out there and, and, and see that. I think it's going to be a ton of fun. Um, hopefully it's better for them than my first experience in New York City. I remember I was a little kid. My grandparents were going to take me to New York City, and I, was, I don't know, might have been eight years old. All I knew was really big buildings. And the one morning I wake up with a stiff neck. So, you know, you wake up five in the morning, drive there, and I couldn't look up. I couldn't see the Empire State Building. I could see like the first 10 floors, right? But that was about it. So hopefully uh, my kids will have more fun than I did the first time. Absolutely, yeah. I, that sounds uh, pretty scary, but I'm glad you're here with us now, Jim. And, and I'm actually on the 48th floor here uh, in the Sheraton. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty high. Um, well, I want to say thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. I'll see you around the conference and uh, looking forward to the next one. All right, thanks, Jordan.